in Egyptian history. With regards to the religion of the Pharaoh of Moses, the Quran makes the following claim. The Quran states that the Pharaoh of Moses was arrogant, exalting himself to the position of God. Modern archaeological discoveries have proven this to be true. Ramesses II built the great temple at Abu Simbel to honour himself. Its entrance is flanked by four colossal statues of Ramesses II, which dwarf the statue of Ra Horakti, god of the horizon, located above it. This temple also contains an image of Ramesses II, making a sacrifice to his divine self. The Quran makes the following claim about the Pharaoh of Moses, who God drowned in the sea. We can see that the Quran explicitly states that the Pharaoh's body will be preserved as a sign for future generations. Note that the Quran never makes such a statement about any of the other destroyed nations that it discusses, typically stating that their abandoned buildings and ruins have been made signs for later generations. This claim about a body being preserved is unique to the Pharaoh of Moses. The body of Ramesses II was discovered by archaeologists in the year 1881 CE. The mummy has been on display in the Cairo Museum, and over the last century, it has been seen by millions of tourists from all over the world. In the following documentary, Sir Tony Robinson states that Ramesses II is one of the few pharaohs whose body has survived largely intact. Just across the river from Luxor lies the famous Valley of the Kings, where Ramesses himself was buried. His mummy was discovered in 1881. One of the few pharaohs whose body has survived largely intact. Historically, priests had concealed his body in a secret location in the year 1000 BCE because of a problem with grave robbers. Nothing was known about his mummy in the intervening period of almost 3,000 years. At the time the Quran was revealed, the whereabouts and fate of Pharaoh's body was unknown. During the 3,000 year period in which the body was hidden, it could easily have been damaged or stolen. It may have even remained lost forever, locked away in its secret location, never to be rediscovered. If you think about it, these statements in the Quran are not only historically accurate, but also represent quite a bold prophecy. The Bible informs us about a series of plagues that God brought upon Egypt. The book of Exodus informs us that the first six of these plagues are as follows. First, the Nile was turned into blood. Second, masses of frogs. Third, swarms of mosquitoes. Fourth, swarms of flies. Fifth, the death of livestock. Sixth, boils on people and animals. Now at first glance, this series of plagues in the biblical narrative may seem random and unrelated. However, the Quran sheds light on these events. The Quran states the following about the divine punishments against Egypt. Notice the first punishment mentioned by the Quran, a flood. This is an important detail that is not found in the Bible. This punishment of a flood actually explains the six seemingly random and unrelated plagues in the biblical narrative. A flood would result in high concentrations of red earth entering the Nile River and causing a blood-like colour, killing fish and making the water undrinkable, as described in the biblical narrative. This phenomenon is attested to historically, as recorded by a Middle Kingdom Egyptian sage See, the river is blood. One shrinks from other people and thirsts for water. The rest of the biblical plagues are also easily explained as a consequence of the flood. 
frogs, mentioned in plague number two, are known to fill the land after Nile floods. The death of the frogs recorded in the biblical narrative can be caused by contamination of anthrax that was carried over from the rotting fish. Mosquitoes, mentioned in plague number three, proliferate after Nile floods, as the pools of water left over from the flooding would have allowed them to overbreed. Swarms of flies, mentioned in plague number four, would be brought about by the massive death of frogs on the land. The death of pasturing livestock, mentioned in plague number five, can be explained by anthrax, as brought on the land by the frogs. The boils on humans and cattle, mentioned in plague number six, may have been caused by bites. The stable fly in particular is infamous for its vicious biting of mammals. We can see that the Quran's mention of a flood easily explains the biblical plagues, which are not random as initially appears to be the case, but in fact a series of interrelated events. The Quran mentions the following incident about Joseph while he was in Egypt. Here the Quran states that Joseph was sold for a paltry price. The Arabic phrase used is Darahima Ma'dudatin, which contains the words dirham and ma'dud. Dirham means a unit of silver coinage or weight. Ma'dud means countable or limited in number. So the Quran is making the claim that Joseph was sold for a small amount of countable silver. There is plenty of historical evidence that standardized units of silver were used in transactions in ancient Egypt. Small pieces of silver, known as shati, were used in trade. The tomb of Nyanknum and Knumhotep is dated to the Old Kingdom period. It contains a scene of a busy open-air market with goods for sale. Cubits of cloth, for example, are said to be sold for six shati. The Rind mathematical papyrus is dated to the Second Intermediate period. It discusses the relative values of gold, silver and lead in terms of shati. Small silver bars bearing the name of Pharaoh Tutankhamun have been dated to the New Kingdom period. They are inscribed with a hieroglyphic which states Tutankhamun, ruler of Heliopolis in Upper Egypt. Until recently, historians believed that the minting of precious metals was a later Greek invention. These recent Egyptian archaeological discoveries have forced historians to completely revise their understanding of coinage in the ancient world. How is it possible that such knowledge was revealed in the Quran nearly one and a half thousand years ago? The Bible mentions that Joseph was sold for 20 of silver. However, this sale is said to have taken place with some Arabs outside Egypt. By contrast, the Quran states that the sale took place inside Egypt. So, the Bible could not have been used as a source by the Quran. It is in fact the Bible that contains historical errors when it comes to coinage. For example, the Bible makes the claim that a gold coin known as the Darik was used at the time of King David. They gave toward the work on the Temple of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 Dariks of gold. As historians point out, the Darik is named after the Persian leader Darius the Great, who lived hundreds of years after King David. The Jewish Encyclopedia acknowledges this error. A notable instance of anachronism occurs in 1 Chronicles 29.7. Gold Dariks, coins which were not struck before the time of King Darius I, i.e. more than 400 years after David. The Quran narrates the following conversation between the Pharaoh of Moses and an individual referred to as Haman. Here Pharaoh commanded Haman to build a tower that would allow him to reach the heavens. 
it's important to understand that Pharaoh's intention was not to literally scale a tower to reach the sky. Rather, it's a reference to the Egyptian belief that after death, the Pharaoh would ascend from earth to heaven, taking his place among the gods. As we covered earlier, the author of the Quran had an awareness of ancient pyramid texts that detailed such beliefs. Egyptian monuments housed the bodies of dead pharaohs. These monuments acted as a bridge between this world and the next. They were filled with religious writings that served as instructions to help the dead pharaoh ascend to the heavens. Hence, the person in charge of constructing such a monument for pharaoh would not only need to be skilled in architecture, but also highly knowledgeable in religion, a builder priest of sorts. Let's now turn to history to see if we can identify an individual known as Haman, who was both a builder and a priest. Earlier we concluded that Ramesses II was the pharaoh at the time of Moses, so we will focus on this time period. A block statue in the Egyptian Museum of Munich contains a biographical account of the life of a high priest named Baken Khonsu. In his own words he states, I am one truly reliable, useful to his Lord, who performs beneficent deeds within his temple, I being principal chief of works in the estate of Amun, I erected obelisks of granite stone whose tops reach to the sky. Here, Baken Khonsu tells us that he served the pharaoh in two ways, first by performing rituals in the temple and second as chief architect. In fact, Baken Khonsu was an architect extraordinaire, being one of the greatest in all of ancient Egypt. He is responsible for constructing the Temple of Amun at Karnak, a monument that remains one of the largest religious structures ever created by man. With regards to the priesthood, Baken Khonsu informs us that he had a very long and illustrious career. I was a third prophet of Amun for 15 years. I was a second prophet of Amun for 12 years. He appointed me high priest of Amun for 27 years. Here Baken Khonsu is stating that he served the god Amun throughout his priestly career. Amun is the name of an Egyptian deity who rose to prominence during the New Kingdom period. By the time Baken Khonsu died, he had been a priest for many decades, having served Ramesses II as high priest throughout his reign. Both Ramesses II and Baken Khonsu were contemporaries who died around the same time. What about the Qur'an's mention of Haman? How does it relate to Bakin Khonsu? Bakin Khonsu referred to himself by the title High Priest of Amun. The actual phrase in the hieroglyphics is Ham Nata Tapi Amana. The word Ham literally means servant and Amana is how you articulate the name of the god Amun in Egyptian. Bakin Khonsu was Ham Amana meaning servant of Amun. The Qur'an's mention of Haman may be simply an Arabized version of the Egyptian Hamamana. Let's now summarize the main points about Bakin Khonsu. He was a senior ranking figure under Pharaoh Ramesses II, acting as both high priest and chief architect. He served in the temple of the god Amun and thus had the title Hamamana. It is clear that all of the historical evidence fits perfectly with the Qur'anic narrative. Now it's important to point out that the Bible also mentions a Haman, but the resemblance is only in name. The biblical Haman served under a Persian king and bears no relation to the Qur'anic Haman of Egypt. Yet again, these are details that are completely missing in the biblical narrative. In this video we have seen that the Qur'an has a remarkable insight into many facets of ancient Egypt, revealing long lost knowledge while also correcting the Bible. Claims that the author of the Qur'an copied from the Bible are clearly rubbished in light of such facts. The Qur'an boldly declares its origins. To learn more about the miracles of the Qur'an, please download your free copy of the book, The Eternal Challenge, at the link below.
if you guys have read the eternal challenge book what's it all about um i usually don't like um videos that compare um different religions especially if it's always going to be islam and christianity it doesn't make sense because a lot of other um religions exist but then at the end of this i just realized that um, it's actually good to get comparisons once in a while to be reminded of things that happen they're talking about raman if i'm not mistaken both books the quran and the bible have the name but both served different kings what's that telling us that's telling us to go out there and research there was another thing talking about the water turning red uh the frogs the what both books have this the same um six signs but different stories as well just like the death of jesus is contested while well, these people are saying no this happened these other ones are saying no this happened it's really interesting and very intriguing because then you you sit down and actually think of so what am i going to believe should i choose this or should I choose this? The good thing is that's why you have this time to go out there and just do your own research. At the end of the day, you're going to end up with either one of the two or nothing. And another thing I wanted to ask is the buildings that were building because they showed something and it had, I didn't see any windows. How were people surviving back then? How were, how were they lit? Like how was light coming in? Wasn't it? I know they used some sort of fire, uh, these fire torches or something, but then how, just how were they able to breathe or see anything in those stone temples or not temples, but buildings they built. Let me know what you guys think. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and of course, do not forget to subscribe and I'll see you in my next reaction video.